Welcome to Cornerstone Baptist, the last Sunday of November. One more month in 2021. And one of the things that maybe we should consider is, I can't wait for this year to be over. You ever feel that way? You ever think that maybe next year will be worse, humanly speaking, than 2021? And that that's okay, because God plans for our good and for his glory and for our growth, not necessarily for our comfort. Not necessarily even for righteousness to always abound, you might say. So here's a question for us, even relating to the news of the last few weeks. Does it bother you when people can destroy cities and get away with it? And when somebody who tries to defend their friends gets in trouble for it? Does it bother you when wicked people curse you for doing the right thing? Maybe it's those closest to you. You try to help them and they just don't appreciate it and then even curse you in spite of it. I wonder, this is maybe a little bit more pointed. Does it bother you that you actually have to live on the same planet as wicked people? Do you see that as an opportunity to share Christ and to share the gospel, or do you see it as an inconvenience to you? Two weeks ago, we were in Isaiah 53, and what a glorious but horrid picture of our Savior's sacrifice in our place. He took our place on the cross because of his love for us and because of his plans for us. He, he actually gained the victory through his death on the cross. And then last week we saw in 54 and 55 this grand invitation. Are you thirsty? Are you dissatisfied? Are you hungry? Come, come and be satisfied, God says. But then this week, it's a continuation of this whole theme. But this week we're in 56 and 57. And it's interesting that it's kind of a flip-flop back and forth. Do you want to be blessed by God, or do you want to be cursed by God? And, and the theme goes back and forth several times, and we will develop that this morning. What sticks out as, to us in all this whole section is that God loves to bless those who will turn from their sin and trust Him. But God's not afraid to curse those who refuse to do that. And for us this morning, are we willing to turn from our sins and to trust him as knowing what's best for us? Or are we going to hold on to our sins and continue in our cursed situation before God? So that's where we're going this morning. Let's take our hymnals as we begin. Hymn number 25. Hymn number 25. Let's stand as we sing this.
number 63. We praise you that you do not leave us in our sin. We praise you that you came to seek and to save the lost. That you love to pour out your blessing on those that will humble themselves and turn from their sin and, and trust in you. We ask for those this morning who are not able to be here because they're either quarantined or ill or traveling. There's so many different things that happen, but I pray that your comfort and your peace would be with them today. We ask for opportunities in the week ahead to share the blessing of the gospel with others. We ask for opportunities to open up in our conversations. We ask that we be intentional about those conversations and finding ways to talk about how you changed our hearts and you'd love to change others as well. We ask this morning that we would seek the path of blessing in our lives by trusting you and obeying you, as opposed to holding fast to our sin and to be cursed in your presence. Encourage us, spur us on, challenge us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Once again, thank you for last week and recognizing our time here with you and 25 years and we appreciate your love and your care for us. A few brief announcements, of leaders meeting not tomorrow but the week after the December 6th and this is when things start to really gear up as leaders as we try to make decisions about people needs so if you're a church member here at Cornerstone and you are praying, I trust that you're praying about your ministries here. And if you're interested in certain very specific ministries, see one of the leaders, Dick, Kevin, Mike. Uh, yeah, Dick, Kevin, Mike, I, or Bob. You can even call him if you want. And just let us know what you're interested in being involved in. Would remind you of the church cleaning schedule. There's nobody signed up for December at this point, I don't think. So just check on the calendar. Appreciate those who have been involved in the cleaning. 
And then December 19th, there are flyers in the back for you to hand to your friends and family, your neighbors about the Christmas program. The gospel will be presented in, in the context of reading through, really, the Christmas story starting in Genesis 3, going all the way to Jesus' promise to save eternally those who trust in him. So, be inviting people to that. And then December 19th, after the Christmas program, we will be staying around to work on the building. The pews will disappear that day, the carpet will disappear, and then we will be getting new carpet in that week. Questions, comments? Okay, I, I try to do this each year. Probably we could do it more often, but it's Christmas time, time when you will be possibly handing out Christmas cards or looking for opportunities for a testimony. On the little shelf in the back, there are a choice of a variety of things to hand to people. There's a booklet, the gift. Uh, what if Christmas gave you what you've always wanted? Uh, good opportunity. A green booklet, In Our Joy. This would be aimed more for believers who may be living grumpy lives right now. And, and it will be pointing them to the joy of Christ. A little red booklet for your joy, more aimed for the unbeliever of just how the Christmas story just leads them into joy. It isn't the stuff, it's, it's Christ himself. Then a, a bunch of smaller things, Christmas in three words, a, a, another little booklet. And then smaller tracks, the story, it, it basically is, is the seas that uh, there's different ways to present the gospel. Um, one that I talked about, I think last week, was God, uh, man, sin, Christ, response. And, and you can just develop those themes. This one uses C, starting with creation, and then what happened? Man, sin, so there's the curse, and then there's Christ, then there's the cross, and then the recreation, you know, new birth, and then the commitment to follow Christ. So that is a helpful thing. Um, more Christmas theme, the meaning of Christmas, little tract. There's a bunch of those. Uh, who is Jesus? Uh, and then there's just a little card with, with a, a little manger scene, who is Jesus? And then just a, a business card size. Jesus is the savior of the world, the sacrifice for our sins and the source of salvation. So those are in the back. Um, avail yourselves of them, hand them out. They don't do as much good here. So, so hand them out to people. Also in your bulletin on the fly leaf, we've been going through pictures of the local church, a body, and really there's no such thing as detached body parts that are effective. Uh, a building, again, we don't want to be bricks setting out in the parking lot, but we want to be allow God to build us together into a, a beautiful, stable building in Christ. A bride, Christ is the, is the bridegroom of the church as his bride. Um, it's not me that's his bride, it's us, it's we who are his bride. A peculiar people, a different, special people set aside for Christ to use. But then a, a a fifth one this morning that we'll develop just a little bit more is a flock over which Christ is the shepherd. And flocks gather together. And with a sheep wandering and off by itself, that is not normal for a flock. So flocks gather. And we should be aiming to gather together. And then Christ is assigned under shepherds to shepherd the flock. And are we placing ourselves under that authority of the local church and a shepherd that God has placed over. And then a, another picture is in Ephesians chapter 2. It says this, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, and this would be basically between Jew and Gentile, but we could look at it today as people that just don't get along. But he's abolished the enmity to make in himself of two, one new man, so making peace. So there's this picture of the church as a new man, a new person, a, a new bunch of people working together 
as opposed to the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing. We're, we're now combined in a new man. And again, the main point was the elimination of the distinction between Jew and Gentile. It used to be that they were irreconcilable differences. Now, Christ himself has made us one. And some challenges to me is, do I sometimes say I can't stand that person? Well, Christ died to break that enmity, to, to shove that enmity aside and make us into one new man. He broke down the walls. So any walls that remain between us and somebody else are walls that we have built, not that Christ has. And then are we glad to have fellowship with people with different backgrounds, people that are different than we are? And that's sometimes enjoyable to have people that are different. There's, there, we had an enjoyable Thursday with Nathan and his family and another person from here at church and we were all different, different personalities and watching each other but yet getting along, sometimes it can get irritating, can it? And the lesson for us from this picture of the one new man that Christ has made is, is that our connection point is not in what we enjoy about each other. The connection point is not that we all hunt or that we're all seamstresses or that we all like a certain kind of vehicle. The connection point is in Christ himself. And are we seeing Christ as our focal point? And as you've seen this picture, the triangle, as we all get closer to Christ, we get closer to each other. And that would be a lesson for this morning. Let's take our Bibles and we will do our scripture reading out of Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56. We'll be covering two chapters, 56 and 57. We'll just read these 12 verses this morning. Again, you'll notice a back and forth between blessing and cursing. Thus saith the Lord, keep you judgment and do justice. For my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doth this. And the Son of Man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Even to them will I give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. The Lord God, which gathereth the outcasts of Israel, saith, Yet will I gather others to him, beside those that are gathered to him. All you beasts of the field come to devour, yea, all you beasts in the forest. His watchmen are blind, they are all ignorant, they are all dumb dogs, they cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs, which can never have enough. They are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his own gain, from his own quarter. Come, you, say they, I will fetch wine, we will fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow will be like today, and much more abundant. We'll cover that in a few minutes, as well as chapter 57. Let's take our hymnals again. We'll turn to hymn number 94. God loves to pour out his blessing on us, and this song speaks of that. 94.
God's blessing and trust that you pray for God's blessing and then you put yourself in a place of trust and obedience and humility where he can bless you so Isaiah 56 and 57 I'll make this comment now I trust that you are reading ahead I try to put in the bulletin what we're doing the next week so for next week read through Isaiah 58 59 it will help you I promise uh, you might read through it a few times and you might still say man I can't quite get it but at least you will have read through it a few times but if you come into a blind on a Sunday morning uh, I, I would say you're at a distinct disadvantage as it comes to understanding God's Word one of the absolute truths in this section in these chapters is that righteousness comes from God all the way through the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, uh, Jews, the Israelites, were told and warned that they had to obey God or else. They tried to either obey on their own power or they just said, I don't really care. It didn't matter which reason, whether they tried on their own or whether they didn't even care, they were judged because of sin. Now in the second section, 40 and following, we're called to the blessing that God gives. And then as I mentioned earlier, Isaiah 53 says how this blessing can be applied to us. Christ himself paid our penalty for sin. And by trusting in him, we can be forgiven and then have the strength to have victory in the future. But then these following chapters then develop this theme. It develops it in a way that, that says, if you're dissatisfied with the way things are going in your life, come to me, God says. That was last week in chapter 55. But then this week we see this back and forth, this alternating between those who trust Christ and experience blessing, or those that rebel against Christ or just ignore him. And then they are cursed and they suffer for it. So we go back and forth on that. So Jesus lived a perfect life that we could not live and then died the death that we deserve to die so that by simple faith in him, we could live productive lives here 
and then live with God eternally in the future. The blessing and cursing theme comes right to the end of chapter 57, where in verse 21 says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Now we talked about that a few weeks ago, I'll just remind us. There are three sections in Isaiah 40 through 66. Each have nine chapters, each divided by this one verse. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. So we are finishing this section this morning of, of Isaiah, this section that presents a Savior that can bless us eternally, but if we reject him, we'll be cursed eternally. And there is no peace, there is no rest. There is only continually and an eternal upheaval for those who don't trust Christ. So let's just notice this, we'll develop it as we go through. The first eight verses in chapter 56 is blessing. Humble outcasts are welcomed into God's presence. Humble outcasts are welcomed into God's presence. Well, who are the outcasts? There's two different ones listed here. There are Gentiles, Remember that the Jews were God's chosen people, the Gentiles were not. So the Gentiles were seen as outcasts, not deserving God's presence and blessing. Well, they are now welcomed. And remember in chapter 55, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come and buy and eat. Ye come buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread? and your labor for that which satisfies not. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat that which is good. Let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even to the sure mercies of David. God is inviting anybody who thirsts to come, even those that were outcasts, whether they're Gentiles, or there's this other group of people that is described here, the eunuchs. Um, you know, no gentle way to say it. These were, these were males who were no longer males. that had been taken from them. And they were seen as outcasts. They were not welcome into the Old Testament temple. And God says, Gentiles, and eunuchs, don't see yourselves as outcast. Are you thirsty? Come. So these humble outcasts are welcomed. The condition of blessing in verse 1 is to do justice, keep judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Judgment refers to the law and the proper use of the law, living in line with God's commands, and justice refers more to righteousness or God's character. So are you living in line with God's commands and are you living in line with God's character? And you might say, I I've tried and I failed. Well, that's where the blessing of faith in Christ comes in. This promise of blessing in verse two, blessed is the man that doeth this. Psalm 1 speaks this way, blessed is a man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, etc., but instead is delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. There are other places in the Psalms that talk about that. Jesus preached in this very similar way in the Sermon on the Mount, in what we call the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. What is the condition of blessing? Again, reflect God's ethics. The end of verse 2. You keep the Sabbath from polluting it, and you keep your hand from doing any evil. So this is one of those, you start in one place, keep God's ethics, the blessing is promised, and then you wind it up where you started, keep God's ethics. The point of the Sabbath in verse 2, and then it's listed again uh, in verse 4, and listed again in verse 6, it's more than just the day. The point is, are we not polluting it by doing things that would pollute our lives? 
And here were people that on the Sabbath day were doing things that they wanted to do. And we'll get into that more in these next verses. They were doing what, what they desired rather than what God desired. And when we come into God's presence, when we truly trust him, we understand that what he desires for us is good. What he desires for us is satisfaction, satisfactory and is satisfying. So we come to him and we do what he wants because we know it's what's best for us. So the point is again, not ritual Sabbath observance, but humbly doing what God wants. Oh, there is an insert in your bulletin, you don't have to read it now. Probably don't read it now, but on Sabbath observance, just to help you think through that at some point if you're interested. Verses three through eight, again, this blessing is promised to traditional outsiders. The two examples, eunuchs and Gentiles, um, there's a sandwich here. The first is verse three, the stranger, and then the end of verse three, the eunuch, and then we come to the eunuch, and then to the stranger again in verses six and seven. So it's, again, one of these start here and end the same place. And the Gentiles are promised blessing in verses three, and then in six and seven. We'll just deal with the two kinds of people instead of going by the verses. This invitation would have been a surprise to the Jews. God, what are you doing inviting those ugly people into our presence? But it wasn't specifically into their presence, it was into God's presence. And God says, anybody who wants to come can come. God had excluded foreigners and eunuchs from his worship. Not, again, we won't get into this a lot, not because they were unsatisfactory in themselves. We all are unsatisfactory. But God is making a point about holiness, about being distinct from the world and being pure. Notice the conditions for blessing in, again, verses 3 and then 6. There's allegiance. They have utterly, uh, um, they have joined themselves to the Lord. It says in verse 3, the son of the stranger. Um, the, the, there has been this commitment they've made to follow Christ. And then in verse 6, um, they serve him. So that, again, it uses the term, they join themselves to the Lord. And they serve him. There are two different kinds of service here. This word serve is often translated worship. It's used in the context of worship. It's used of, of the priests going through the ritual service in the temple. So they are, these people are serving God in the way that God has prescribed. They are devoted to the Lord. They love the name of the Lord in verse 6. They are his servants. Again, this is the word bond slave different than the other service um, earlier in the verse. And then to everyone that keeps the Sabbath, again, I'm, I'm just taking that as they're willing to be obedient. They're willing to do what God demands them to do. It might not make sense to you, but, but when God tells you, you know, you ought to set aside a day to worship me, you say, okay, God, I, I believe that that's going to be best for my spiritual life and for my relationship to you, so I'm going to obey you. And then allegiance again, they take hold of my covenant. So again, it begins with allegiance, ends with allegiance. They take God's covenant seriously. They grab it. Have you ever signed, saw the dotted line and you didn't even read what you signed? If you do much work online, you do this all the time, don't you? Do you agree to these? Check the box. Yep, I checked the box. And there were 20 pages of fine print. You didn't even read it, much less agree to it, but you checked the box. Sometimes people do this. They check the box with God without being committed to this covenant that God wants to make with us. Remember 55 again, chapter 55, verse 3, where when we come to God for satisfaction, he says, I will make an everlasting covenant with you. When we trust Christ, he never, ever will go back on his word to save us. Well, people take that seriously, verse 6. So those are conditions for blessing. 
But then the eunuchs are also promised blessing in verses 3b and then 4 and 5. Notice the conditions and obedience. Um, the eunuchs might say, I'm a dry tree, I don't have any kids. But thus says the Lord to the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths. Here we are again, willingness to obey what God says. And then there's this devotion that they have. They choose to live in ways that please God. They choose the things that please me. And we've said this several times throughout the years, two choices on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. And this is the choice that God holds up to us. Do you want to be blessed or do you want to be cursed? God promises blessing to eunuchs, traditional outsiders, but who devote themselves to doing what pleases God. And then allegiance again, they take God's covenant seriously, the end of verse 4. And then the blessings that are promised, 3b, you're not going to be unfruitful. Don't say, don't say that you're a dry tree. Why? Because you're going to have, verse 5, sons and daughters even greater than you might have um, if you were not a eunuch. So God promises you're not going to be unfruitful. If you come to me for satisfaction and do what I desire for you to do, I wonder if you felt like you've wasted your life. If you felt like, oh, I blew last week or I blew yesterday or I blew that hour of my life. God says you don't have to be unfruitful. You can right now trust me and turn from your sin and come to me and be satisfied and I will make you fruitful. I will give you an eternal name. You once were nobodies, you once were outsiders, you once were outcasts. And God initiates this whole process of drawing us to himself. He says, come, come and be satisfied. And then verse eight is encouraging. The Lord God, which gathers the outcasts of Israel says, yet I will gather others to him besides those that are gathered to him. Okay, so God it gathered his chosen people, Israel, together to bless them. But then God had told Abraham, through you shall all the people of the earth be blessed. And now we're promised again by God in verse 8 that there are others besides the Israelites who God wants to bless, who God wants to gather to himself. Jesus said in John 17, there are others who are not of this fold that I will bring. What is this fold? Well, they were the Israelites. But he says, there's others that I'm going to bring to myself too. Well, that's us. But that's also our family members that don't know Christ, that God extends the invitation to. It says, come and be blessed. Don't look at yourself as the outsider. Sure, you may have wasted your life so far, but God says, come, be satisfied. Come, be blessed. Come, be fruitful. Verse 1, my salvation is near. It, it, all you have to do is reach out and grab it by faith. My righteousness is coming. But now in verse 9 of chapter 56 of Isaiah, there's a sharp turn that is taken. The cursed Self-indulgent leaders are devoured by the enemy. Here's these self-serving leaders of Israel. The elders of Israel, you might say. They should have been protecting the vulnerable flock, but instead they were doing what they wanted to do, and they weren't caring for others. And God says, discipline's coming, verse 9. What, what is God talking about in verse 9? All you beasts of the field come to devour. Um, remember how God said to Assyria, okay, come down to the northern kingdom Israel and take them away in punishment. And then God said to Babylon, come to the southern kingdom of Judah, come and take them away for this discipline that I, that I have planned for them that you are going to accomplish. So God is saying to the the enemies of God and the enemies of God's people come and devour these wicked people. There's a curse 
that God brings on those that will not obey him, will not trust him. Well, what is the cause of the curse? Verses 10, 11, and 12. All the Israel's leaders had failed. They had failed to exercise discernment in verse 10. They were blind. They were ignorant. Um, their specific task as leaders was to watch, to, to watch for dangers, to watch for the enemy, to warn of the enemy, and they didn't. But that leads us to this next failure, this failure to sound the warning. They were dumb dogs. A dumb dog is one who doesn't bark. We had a dog that barked. It would bark when it wasn't dangerous. And then when, I, when somebody who was dangerous came along, he'd, he'd walk him into the house, you know, wag his tail, you know, hey, come on in, you know. Um, well, here were dumb dogs. Dogs, leaders of Israel that would not sound the warning. But then they were also failing to stand guard alertly. They were sleeping dogs. The end of verse 10. They were lying down. They loved to slumber. And we had a dog like that, too. Just sleep through anything. And God says to the leaders, you need to stay alert. And he would say to us as well, you need to stay alert to the dangers and then warn others of the, war of the dangers that you see. Then as we move on in verse 11, they were failing to shepherd wisely. They looked to their own way they looked everyone for his own gain. And we see pastors today like this. We see parents today like this. We see bosses today like this, but I would say we see employees today like this, and we see consumers today like this. We see everybody out for what they think will get them in. And this is a warning from God. The cause of the curse is this selfishness, doing the things our own way, not God's. And then failure to serve with integrity, rather than looking for God's purposes, they were looking for their own gain, the end of verse 11 there, from his own house, from his own position. You ever know somebody that could only see things from their point of view, from their own quarter, from their own house? Well, from my perspective, and that's what they will always say, rather than saying, tell me what you, how, how do you see things? How does God see things? So they fail to serve God with integrity, and then in verse 12, they fail to control their fleshly desires. Let's go get drunk, and let's do it again tomorrow, and tomorrow's going to be even better than today. What a, what a lousy way to approach life, and we see people like this today. Let's just, go, let's just go blow this evening, and then let's go do it again tomorrow. Hey, better days are coming. Yeah. Well, no, better days are not coming if that's our approach. God says, come to me for satisfaction, chapter 55. Now, for chapter 57, we turn the corner again. The righteous perishes Nobody cares. No man lays it to heart. Merciful men are taken away. Merciful, loving, kind people are taken away. Nobody considers that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. So question, does that encourage you to see righteous people die? And you, and you pause and you think, I don't know, does it? And this year has been filled, it seems like, in, in my own life with, with loved ones. My dad dying. A, a loved 86-year-old pastor dying. Um, a loved 59-year-old servant in the pew dying. And several others. You see, am I to say that that's a good thing or a bad thing? I'm looking at this as it's presented here as a blessing. How can this be a blessing? Well, the righteous people are rescued through death. 
not rescued necessarily from death. They're rescued from what? They're rescued from the evil, the end of verse 1, chapter 57, verse 1. Nobody considers that the righteous are taken away from the evil that's going to happen. So the death of the righteous is often misunderstood. Um, the death of the righteous is often a blessing. They don't have to face the evil that we have to face. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Usually we say it this way. I'd love for the Lord to come back right now because this world's a mess and I don't want to face it anymore. Well, well death accomplishes the same purpose. Where, where death takes us into the Lord's presence and we escape the evil that's around us. So it's a blessing. It's a blessing because they don't have to face the evil that we have to face. But the death, again, nobody takes it to heart. Oh, there goes another one. First part of verse one. Nobody takes it to heart. Oh, there goes another person. They just, another one died. Who cares? Sometimes they say, God, why did you punish them by taking them? Is it a punishment to be taken into God's presence? You see, sometimes we really misunderstand this. So it's a blessing in that we're able to escape this corrupt culture and its punishment, and we enter into the presence of God. Verse 2, they shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds. We use this term in, in funerals, don't we? Or in obituaries, they entered into their rest on such and such a date and time. And God is using that term for us as a blessing. Should we seek to die today? That, that's a fun one, isn't it? And what we have to say, we learn from the Apostle Paul. To die today would be far better because they enter Christ's presence. However, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. God has a purpose for me to live today. So I'm going to sacrifice myself for Christ today to accomplish his purposes for me. So there's blessings. Some righteous people are rescued through death. Some are not. But then we have this cursing again, verse 3 in chapter 57 on through verse 13. There's some R-rated stuff in here that God is accusing these wicked people of doing. These are people who claim to worship God. God is talking to people from Israel, children of Israel. They claim to know God, but yet they're doing wicked things. And these idolatrous, these fleshly worshipers are, are brought out into the open. They're exposed. You see, many times when people who claim to know God, when we sin, we tend to try to hide it. But God brings us out into the open. And then it's like chaff, it's, and it just gets blown away. And that's the description here of these idolatrous fleshly worshipers. Notice the summons in verses 3 and 4. Draw near here, hither, you sons of the sorceress, the seed of the adulterer and the whore. Wow, that's pretty rugged language, isn't it? Um, we would use the term bastard today, you know, illegitimate child. There was this prostitute, and there's this uh, adulterer who got together, and you're their child, you're their illegitimate child. You come here, you come here right now, God says. God is calling them into, into judgment. And God accuses them of mocking the godly while they live deceitful lives. Against whom do you sport yourselves? You're having fun sporting yourselves. At, you're, you're making fun of the godly people. Against whom do you make a wide mouth and draw out the tongue? You're sticking out your tongue at these godly people. Are you not children of transgression and seed of falsehood? So God is, is really calling people to himself in judgment if they are not trusting Christ. You will either come to God trusting him to get satisfied or you'll come to him for judgment and for cursing. Which way do you choose to come? So what are the offenses? What did they do wrong? Uh, you, you can picture this. 
your mom or your dad says, Daniel Lee, come here. Oh, what did I do? Sometimes you knew. Sometimes you had done so many things you didn't know what they were talking about. I hope they didn't find about this and this and this. But maybe it was this. Well, they call you. What were the offenses? Well, 5A, inflame yourselves with idols under every green tree. Uh, that is a sexual picture. It, it's, um, again, it's R-rated. We see this sexual perversion all around us today. It's celebrated. It's worshipped. How do we know it's worshipped? Try to take it away from somebody. See how they respond. Well, what else? The end of verse 5, this child sacrificed, slain the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rocks. Again, we see this today all around us as well, often related to the sexual perversion. My body, my choice. I choose to be sexually perverted. The results in a child, I choose to slaughter the child, child sacrifice. There was more than that back in the Old Testament. This was actual children, older children being sacrificed. But either way, we see these types of things today. But then I think we could also expand the application a, a little bit to say, we say children living today that are being sacrificed on the altar of the parents' entertainment, or the parent's ease and pleasure. They're not being brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They're not being brought up in ways that would draw that child to faith in Christ. They're being sacrificed on the parent's own pleasures. We see that, again, all around us today. This is applicable to us. Verse 6, a dog tree of nature People making great sacrifices to stones, to hills, to trees. And again, we see this today. People willing to pour out expenses, sacri expensive sacrifices to save the planet. And they don't care a bit about their souls or anybody else's soul. What is temporary, they're willing to sacrifice for. What is eternal, they don't even think about. They worship nature. Now, uh, just pause. I, I'm a farm boy, and, and we were very careful stewards of God's creation. It did us very little good as farmers to watch the dirt go down the creek. So we put berms and diversion ditches and all those kinds of things to preserve nature. We managed our forests so they would grow even more wood. So yes, we are to steward what we are given, but we don't worship it. We worship the God who created it. Then there's idolatry of sexual perversion again in cha chapter 57, verse eight. They delighted in nakedness, they delighted in sexual perversion. There's this term, um, you've enlarged your bed in King, in, in King James. Some translations call it a wide bed. W what might we mean by that? Well, casual sex rather than the narrow bed of marriage sex, you know, sex within marriage. And we see that all around us today too, don't we? The end of verse 8 on into verse 9, political alliances. Most likely, these were sexual in nature, um, where you know they would give their daughter to the unsaved neighbor to make an agreement with them to seal the deal, so to speak. We saw this with kings taking another wife from a king's daughter over here or over there. Well, today we see political alliances being made in order to continue people's perversions. People are willing to make a big stink and to threaten the political leaders if they don't get their own perverted way. So we see a lot of chapter 57 right in our own lives today. 
In verses 10 and 11, we see the idolatry of personal independence from God. You're wearied in the greatness of your way, yet, yet, you said not, there is no hope. You have found the life of your hand, therefore thou wast not grieved. And you say, Pastor, I don't understand a thing of what that said. It took me a little while. I, I worked my way through it. I, I encourage you to read it in several different translations. That often helps. Sometimes it helps to, to have a study Bible that may give you a few comments in there. But my understanding of verses 10 and 11 are that people get tired of where their wickedness is taking them. They say, I don't know if I can do this anymore. They're tired of it, but rather than turn from it and turn to God, they say, tomorrow will be better. We'll get through this. Um, you, you haven't said there's no hope. You, you still say, there's hope for tomorrow. Where's the hope? Let's just do more of the same or maybe even do it worse. Personal independence from God. They still keep doing their own thing. And then the end of verse 11 is, is really what brings it to a head. You fear me not. God says, you don't look at me and trust me. You don't look at me and fear me. So this is the offenses that lead them to the sentence in verses 12 and 13. The sentence of these idolaters, verse 12, I will declare your righteousness and your works, for they shall not profit thee. God is saying, okay, you, you're, you're trying to trust in your good works. How many people, if you ask, are you going to go to heaven when you die? Hey, I think so. I've been a pretty good person. I've done this, 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 and this. Well, well as opposed to what? Well, I, I got on the scales here, and God says, I'm, I'm listing off your righteous works. I'm, I'm declaring them to you. It's not going to help. I can remember as a kid going Christmas shopping. And you know how kids Christmas shop. One for them, one for me. You, you know. And I pull my wad of cash out of my pocket and I flip it out, you know, like this. And the cashier says, ah, that's not enough. And that's what God does. We're, we're here, we're, we're counting out our righteous deeds. God says, nope, not going to help. It's not even going to help. Notice he doesn't say it's, it's not satisfactory payment. It says, it's not even going to help you. All those things you've been trusting in, it's not going to help you. And then in verse 13, your idols, when you cry, let your companies deliver you. Those things you've been trusting in, but the wind is going to carry them all away. Vanity. Again, the wind is going to take them. You ever feel like your life has just been blown away? You ever feel like all this you worked so hard to accumulate? It just, the wind comes up and it goes, it's gone. Well, so God says that's part of the curse is to see what we've worked so hard for just disappear. Are we working through faith in God for his purposes? He promises satisfaction and he promises eternal fruit. But if you're living for yourself, for your own pleasures, there's only cursing to come. Then verses 13b on through verse 19 we come back to this blessing. God lives with the humbled and the healed sinners. So 13b, but he that puts his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. So the humble are invited to trust God and to live with him. Trust is the pathway or trust is the roadway through which we get into God's presence. Didn't Jesus say a very similar thing? You know, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me or but through me. He's the pathway. Trust in him. Verse 14. God has removed all the obstacles. He's taken the stumbling blocks out of the way. 
There is no reason, there's nothing standing in the way between you and trusting Christ. Your friends, they have all of those obstacles that they have placed in the way of them trusting Christ. God has removed every possible obstacle from them trusting Christ. All they have to do is respond to the gospel. That's encouraging. That's encouraging. Share the gospel with them this Christmas. Christ came for you. Christ died for you. All you need to do is believe in him. He will forgive you. So he's removed all obstacles. God did that in verse 14. And then verse 15, God promises to breathe life into this humble, trusting heart. Notice verse 15. This is God speaking. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also, that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. This word revive is to breathe life into. We were dead, but God can breathe life into the humble sinner. And then in verses 16 through 19, the humble are not only invited to trust God and live with him, they're healed by God's loving judgment and forgiveness. God's wrath in verse 16 is fully deserved. You know, he's, he says, I will not contend forever, even though you deserve it. I will not always be angry or wroth, even though you deserve it. For the spirit should fail before me and the souls which I have made. God's wrath is deserved, but, verse 17, for the iniquity of his covetousness was thy wrath. What was God angry at? Our sin, our covetousness, our self-interest, verse 17. But, verse 18, God was graciously willing to forgive. He saw us as we were in our sin, yet he was willing to forgive. I have seen his ways, verse 18, and I will heal him. I will lead him also restore comforts to him and to his mourners. God is willing to forgive us if we will humble ourselves before him. And then verse 19, I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, I will heal him. God created, I will create the fruit of his lips. What is the fruit of his lips? This is great, peace. God creates that. Praise on our lips and fruit of peace in our hearts. Can I just stop and kind of look in the mirror myself and maybe urge you to look in the mirror? If you don't have praise on your lips, if you don't have peace in your heart, whose fault is that? Where is that growing out of? Where is grumbling and complaining coming from? It's coming because we have not turned to God for satisfaction. Humble yourself before God. He will create Thanksgiving in you. Sometimes Thanksgiving dinner, when you go around the table and say, so what are you thankful for? Uh, uh, I don't know. And, uh, the peas. No, not the peas. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so that's not gratefulness, is it? But when we're humbling ourselves before God, God is the one that creates this gratefulness that pours out of us and this peace in our hearts. So the interpretation, again, of these verses are that the Jews were far off and the, I mean, the, the Jews were near and the Gentiles were far off. But the application is that those of us, even of believers, that if we have distanced ourselves from God, God wants to restore us to be close to him. And then we have verse 20 and 21. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. The wicked are like the troubled sea. All it does, it just keeps belching out filth. I usually like the smell of the ocean. Sometimes 
the rotten seaweed is a little bit too much. And some of us, very possibly, could be just like that churning sea. It just keeps stirring up the rot. We don't enjoy it, but maybe we haven't been willing to humble ourselves yet. There's no peace to the wicked. That is a challenge. If we won't turn to God, then we will continue experiencing the same rot over and over again. So Isaiah 55, God says, come. If you're thirsty, if you're hungry, come. If you don't have any money, come. Start buying, start buying your satisfaction. How? Without money, without price, trust in God. He will give it to you. He loves to pour out his blessing to those who will trust him. But God is also willing to pour out his cursing eternally to those that will not trust him. You have to appreciate a God like that. A God who doesn't want to spend eternity and doesn't want us to spend eternity with evil. So God is willing to separate people into two groups. Those who are righteous, not because of their own goodness, but because they trust in Christ. And then those who have rejected Christ, and he's willing to curse. And he's willing to do so eternally. Again, appreciate a God like that. Praise a God like that. But I encourage you, humble yourself before God this morning. Let's take our hymnals again. 479. 479. Create in me a clean heart, O, o Father. We'll sing just the first verse. 479. Let's stand as we sing. And then he died in our place as the perfect Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus says, whoever believes in him, whoever trusts in him, will not perish, but will have everlasting life. But believers, some of these pictures are for us. Us that we're near and we've allowed ourselves to become distant. And we're suffering some of the curses that God has said would come because of our sin. Simple solution God presents as to humble ourselves, a humble and contrite heart that comes to him in faith. He restores us. He forgives us. I would urge you to do that. and He will restore to you the joy of your salvation. Your Father, help us to humble ourselves before you. It's easy to be proud. It's easy to think that our way is best. But then we prove otherwise. And Lord, help us to then humble ourselves and come to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.